Thank you for allowing us to have this visit with you. It's an opportunity to learn about you and your long history and uh, the relationship you have with the Horn of Africa in general. Um, before I get to all the other questions, I think it's only relevant and important that you tell us about you. Who is Professor Asparov, like I said? I'm an anthropologist by profession, uh, and uh, my focus has been uh, entirely on uh, Eritrea and uh, the Oromo people uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa, both in Kenya and Ethiopia. And then from that, I branched out to look at the entire Cushitic nation. And I'm now beginning to relate the Cushitic nation to the kingdom of Kush in, uh, uh, in ancient uh, uh, um, Nile Valley civilizations. And so my career will wind up with one book on Eritrea, which, is, uh, which I'm now beginning to write, uh, and uh, another book on, uh, on, on, the Hor on the Horn of Africa that relates uh, the civilizations of the Kushites of Ethiopia and Kenya with that of the kingdom of Kush. Your childhood and what happens in your childhood matters when you grow up, is what they tell us. Mm -hmm. And you have a fascinating story to tell about your childhood, your early childhood education, and the people that informed you mm -hmm. at the very young age, and yeah. uh, how much that impacted what you are today. Great. Tell us a little bit about that, and we'll get into the academics in a little bit. Okay, okay. I grew up in Asmara, uh, and basically a city boy. Uh, knew, knew very hardly anything about rural Eritrea uh, until something happened in 1941. The British began bombarding uh, Eritrea, the Royal Air Force, uh, and our home is one block away from Ferrovia. Ferrovia was their target. A lot of the bombs that they threw, dropped in Fer Fer Ferrovia, ended up in our in our garden. So my family said it's unsafe any longer for the children to live here, so they sent us off to Garami to spend a year with my great-grandfather. And he is a big influence on my life. He was one of five Orthodox ministers, of Orthodox priests, who started a movement within the Orthodox Church to reform the Church and to teach the Bible in a language that people understand. The whole notion of teaching them in Giz, which the priests don't understand, which people don't understand, was the thing that motivated them. Uh, and when they said that, they were sued by Bizen and uh, uh, Debre Debredamo, uh, went to uh, Hase Johannes uh, for, for trial, and Johannes asked them, what is their, their crime? They said, uh, they're trying to teach the Bible in a vulgar language. And wh what is the vulgar language that he asked them? Amharic or Tigrinya. And he says, that's, 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 that's their crime? That's no crime, send them back. So he set, set them free, went back. And then the two monasteries re retooled again and sued them for, for being heretics. And this time, Johannes started, de decided to call, call them back again. And they knew that this time uh, it, was, uh, it was for good. Uh, so they said they will not go to, to, to Tigray. Instead, they fled to Masawa, to first Islet and then to Masawa. They took, took, took refuge under Turkish rule in the Sudan, in, the, in uh, Masawa. Uh, and uh, Munzinger Pasha, uh, governor of uh, uh, lowland Eritrea on behalf of the uh, Ottoman Turks, uh, g gave them refuge in a place called Umkullu, right next to, to, to Masawa. And so they, they lived there uh, for a major part of their lives, and something very strange happened at that stage. There was a group of Oromo slaves being sold into slavery and being shipped off to, uh, to, to, to abroad uh, as slaves. So Munzinger, who is a Christian, but a close friend of Gordon Pasha of the Sudan, who was a Protestant, uh, he took the five uh, 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 slave slaves and handed them over to the uh, to the five uh, uh, Eritrean uh, priests who are in refuge and hoping to write to write the Bible in Tigrinya. So they took they took Onesimus Nesib, their leader, with them to uh, to to Imkulu. He lived with them, grew up with them, uh, matured went to Sweden, was ordained as a, as a Lutheran minister, 
came back speaking half a dozen languages. I think the guy is absolutely brilliant. And they went back to Eritrea to, to translate the Bible into Oromo. While they were, they were translating the Bible into uh, Tigrinya and Tigray and Kunama. So that was the great confluence of the two peoples. So the relationship, the Protestant church was first established in Wallega before it was established in Addis Ababa. That's where the, the reason why you have so many educated uh, people from Wallega was because education was started very early, turn of the century, 19th century, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Wallega. Uh, <clears throat> so, Kes Zoratsun Musay, who was my great grandfather, uh, I was, became very close to him. During that one year I spent with him, it was a really a delightful year, and it deeply impacted me in terms of feeling for rural Eritrea. Uh, the uh, urbanites have great problems going to rural er Eritrea and feeling at home in that environment because it's not as clean as their city environment. you uh, merit and. And they step on that, and they feel that there's something wrong with them. So no, maybe we have all kinds of hang-ups. City boys have all kinds of hang-ups about living or being close to the village environment. So for one year, I was in the village environment and absolutely loved it. And that became one of the great motivations for looking at Eritrea from the rural perspective, not from the urban perspective. I was born in 1931, so I was 10 years old. Uh, <clears throat> now, another person who influenced my life greatly is my um, great uncle, uh, Zer uh, He comes from Shmanugus, and Zer had an amazing life. He was a Gwaza, a herder, a herd boy, in his village when his herd uh, uh, ate up an entire cornfield. Uh, and he says, if I, if I go home now, my father will kill me. So for that reason, he fled from his village. Fled in the general direction of Asmara. He had no, no conception of what he, was, uh, what he was going to. On his way, he says, a boy used to say, Okay, he's, he's diversifying his investments. Okay, invest both in the Orthodox education and the modern education that the, the, Luther, the Lutherans were, were, were offering. So Hawam and his brother, Kashigile, was already being trained to become a priest in the Orthodox Church. So obviously he was destined to become Kanisha. <laughs> and so he asks, where are these people called Kanisha? So they tell him to go to Beleza, and they went to Beleza, and, and there he, they told him this is school, a school for girls, so you could better go, go off to Asmara. So he went to Asmara and registered there, was educated for two years in Asmara. At the end of the two years, he was very ambitious. A teacher told him, a Swedish teacher, told him, if you make it all the way to Sweden on your own, I'll pay for your ed education. Yeah. Uh, and he took his bet, and said, I'll, I'll be there, he told him. <laughs> So he started walking toward the general direction of Sweden. I mean, this is, he's probably 13 years old at this stage, you know. He started walking. He followed a caravan, a camel caravan from Eritrea all the way to, uh, to, to, uh, to Kassala. And from there, he would work at every place that, that he goes. He has, he has been trained in woodworking in, 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 the, in the school. But he's very skilled in, in many things. So he would work for a month, a year in one place, save enough money to go to the next place. So inch by inch, he went from Kassala all the way to Alexandria. It took him exactly 10 years to, make, to complete the trip. 10 years. He started in 1905, arrived in Alexandria in 1915. 1915 was the year that the second, First World War began. He found a job as a stevedore shoveling coal into the steam engine. And that's the, old, the, old, the job that nobody wants. So he got that job and crossed over to, to, uh, to uh, Italy, still heading toward the general, general direction of Sweden. So they told him, if you keep, keep going in a northerly direction, you'll make it to, to Sweden. So by the time he reached uh, uh, Napoli, 
Napoli is in terrible state. There's famine everywhere. People are committing suicide rather than seeing their, their, their children dying from, from hunger. So he goes around begging for a job for nothing, just for a meal and a place to, to, to sleep because he has skills uh, do, do, do woodworking. He found a job doing woodworking in, in, in Naples, worked for a year, few years, and then built enough bookshelves for himself in his spare time and told his, uh, his, uh, his uh, boss, uh, uh, to, uh, he asked him, what, what are these bookshelves for? He says, I'm going to open a grocery store in Naples. So he said, said, but do you have any money? He said, yes, I have 3,000 lire. Well, 3,000 lire is not going to get you very far, he tells him. Well, well you, you, you lend me the money, and I, I'll pay you back when, I, when, I, when I'm done. So that's what he did. He opened a grocery store in Naples. At this stage, he's probably uh, 13, 10, uh, 10 years, about 23 years old at this stage. Okay? So then he opens a, a grocery store in, in Naples, moves to Rome and opens a coffee shop and a grocery store in one of the piazzas of Roma in those days, which is what's totally unique. Of course, and I when I go to, to, to Rome, people t tell me, okay, we'll show you your, your uncle's, uh, your uncle's uh, uh, shops, you know. So he became quite wealthy, four years, decided that that's all the money I need, so he decided to go back to Eritrea. On the way back, by an Italian ship, the ship gets hit by a German U-boat, torpedoed, sinks. He's a fantastic swimmer, swam, swam for, for two hours before reaching a boat that was salvaged from the, from the, uh, from the ship. They allowed him into, into the boat, and then SOS, a Greek sh sh merchant ship, uh, found them, took them to, uh, to Tripoli, and from Tripoli, Inch by inch, he went back to Eritrea, arrived in Eritrea empty-handed, no, not a penny in his, in his pocket, and started all over again in Eritrea as a businessman. <laughs> so, 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 so then, and then and, and tried, he tried very hard to start a plantation in Eritrea, and of course, the Italians told him plantations are allowed to naturally, not, uh, not, not indigene. Uh, and so, uh, waited. Finally, the British, he got into a uh, tussle with the British rulers in Eritrea, and the British rulers were hateful of the fact that the unionist movement had started. He, he was accused of having be, uh, been one of the founders of the unionist uh, movement, jailed, uh, and then was released because Saleh Kekia paid, uh, indemnified them, uh, and paid for them, and were released, but after they were released, they were exp ex expelled to, to Ethiopia. They were exiled to Ethiopia. So they arrived in Ethiopia, the emperor welcomed them, and uh, uh, my uncle said he wants to, to start a plantation. So he told him, take 10 gashas in Ambassel Warera in, uh, in Wallo and start your plantation. He did, and he was extremely successful as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a running the plantation. So he influ impacted my life greatly because during the Second World War, my job was to sit with him when he was every day listening to the, to the radio of the progress of the Second World War with a map of Europe and North Africa on the wall and with a chart of all the battleships of the Axis and the Allies. My job was to put a pin on the ships that have just been sunk. <laughs> Bomb by one on both sides. <laughs> so it's an incredible education for me. But but I became you know deeply uh, uh, attracted by his by his character, his ingenuity, his thinking, his ambition, and so on. So he, along with Kaiserasuen, are the two great influences in my life. The third influence is Walda Walda Mariam, who was my teacher at uh, at Wangelai uh, Christian. We call him Ayya Waldab, not Abwe Waldab, as you people do, uh, because he was then a very young man, <laughs> unmarried, uh, and he was very close to, 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 to my family. And so although my uncle and him were adversaries politically, they had a meal together every day, played chess at the end of the meal, and discussed politics the rest of the, the, rest of the afternoon. And, and the, that was their, their life throughout. When he died, my, when my uncle died, Welda wrote a beautiful uh, 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 obituary that was published and is actually available today. So those, those were the, the people who greatly influenced my life.
You yeah. did your elementary education in Eritrea? In elementary education finished in grade six, uh, but after grade six, there's nothing. In fact, up to grade four, there was nothing uh, before, before we started. With us, under British rule, we went all the way to grade six. An incredible opportunity. Um, uh, Haragot sent his son, Siyum, to Beirut at that stage. We went to, uh, 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 I went to Macquarie College from, uh, from after graduating from, from, from high school. I was in Macquarie College for, for two years and then had to go back to, to, to Ethiopia and finish my uh, higher college education in, uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia. My experience at Macquarie was fascinating because I was all of a sudden in the middle of Africa, uh, in an African kingdom, invited by the Kabaka to the palace uh, because they felt there's kinship between the Ethiopian monarchy and the, the Buganda mon monarchy. So it was a very welcoming and, and delightful experience, and that also influenced me to think in terms of Africa, not just in terms of Ethiopia. Before you went to Makara College, you spent some time in Ethiopia, went to the yeah. schools there. At high, school, at high school and college, high school and college. And the amazing thing is, uh, this is... I went to the high school, which was the Ferry Mokonan, which is the emperor's school. And so he came and visited the school every, every week. On Wednesdays, he was in the school, going around visiting, talking to students who are better performers in, in school than, than, than others and, and giving them gifts and so on. And you'd f actually bring f food would be f f brought from the palace to, to our school. Yes, on the good for us to eat, to eat while the emperor is in the, in, in the school. So, and he brought French-Canadian Jesuits as teachers. So those were my teachers. I mean, you can't get better education than that, you know. <laughs> they were, it, it was, we had laboratories, we had um, Magdabur hemispheres, microscopes, all kinds of fancy stuff, laboratory equipment that, that no, no school in Ethiopia had. And so it was privileged education. And then we went on to, to college. College too was another uh, thing uh, that Emperor Haile Selassie uh, wanted very much. Uh, and he held the portfolio for Ministry of Education himself. There was no minister. He was the minister. Uh, and he ran, he ran the show, I mean, literally. <laughs> and Akalor Haftold was the, the director of education, not the minister of, 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 of education. So I got both my high school education, uh, heavily influenced by French Canadian Jesuits who devote a great deal of attention to philosophy, logic, epistemology, and Thomistic philosophy, you know. <laughs> so it really sharpens the mind. In, in, so, so the people who, were, who got that education became very sharp thinkers, you know. So, uh, so that, that was kind of a privileged uh, uh, education that, uh, that we got at the high school and, and college. In the middle of all that, I took the trip to Macquarie College and got exposed to, uh, in Uganda. Uh, and uh, mainly because they were in the process of op opening University College of Addis Ababa, mm -hmm. and we were the first ones to be deprived uh, of going to England or to America for our education. We had to remain there uh, and get educated in a school that has not been founded yet. Uh, and we rebelled. We were a member, I was a member of the rebellion, and the leader of the rebellion was, was Masfun Waldoariam, professor. Uh, and uh, we, a ministerial cabinet in Ethiopia, uh, because I was involved in a putsch at Macquarie College over the issue of uh, uh, colonial curriculum, which excludes law, political science, and everything that has to do with revolutions. It was cut out from the textbooks. <laughs> so at Macquarie College, yeah. you protested this curriculum, yeah. and that's why you were expelled? That's right. I was expelled uh, because I authored an article that appeared in all the newspapers in, in, uh, in, in Uganda titled Makere at a Standstill. This is before the president heard what was going to happen to his college. He read it in his morning newspaper. <laughs> that was the push that I was part of. <laughs> so, uh, so, of course, he threw us out of the, of the, of the, of the school, went back to Addis Ababa to complete my education at, my, at, at University College of Addis Ababa. And 
somehow you made your way to the United States. Yes. You were here during the civil rights movement. That's so right. you have a background in what really happened with African Americans in the United States. That's right. And you, as being an African uh, transplant, yeah. right. uh, going to higher education here. So tell us a little bit about your life in the United States and okay. uh, the civil rights movement and how it impacted your life after that. It, uh, it did uh, a lot. I mean, we were really, really, we, we were here in the heat of the civil rights movement. Actually, I arrived before it. Uh, I was in uh, America in 1956. Uh, by 1960, uh, the world was uh, upside down. The revolution had started. The youth movement, women's movement was, was uh, in progress. And then the civil rights movement. Uh, by the time uh, I reached, I, uh, I left Harvard uh, to do uh, complete my dissertation while teaching. I was teaching at McCarrick at uh, Swarthmore College. At Swarthmore College, the year that I was there, the school was taken over by black students. The, the, the school administration building was taken over by black students, and I was the only black faculty member. So I had to be intermediary. Black student from Africa, intermediary between the black students and the Swarthmore's administration. They boarded up the building, so I had to go through a window to get to them. So I would spend the night with them and the day with the faculty, negotiating between the two, the, between the two groups. <laughs> the negotiation was completed recently. One of the leaders of that movement had just published an article in the Swarthmoreian Des describing all the stuff that went on in, the, in those days. So basically, we, I was caught in right <laughs> in the throes of the black revolution just as it was, uh, uh, 1968 was the crisis year. That's the, that was the year that Kent State happened, you know, uh, students were being shot by, by, by the army and that kind of, that kind of stuff. So, so I was caught up in the civil rights movement in the campaign to, um, uh, to uh, liberate uh, South Africa by disinvestment. We, we were, it was a big, big movement, and I participated in that fu fully. So in a way, my mind was shaped in the throes of the civil rights movement and the ecology movement, which is simultaneous. 1973 was when the ecology movement peaked, and I was part of that movement too. So my own research, incorporates in it the African identity, the Eritrean identity, the Kushite identity, uh, the black identity more broadly, uh, and all of that becomes part of, part of my thinking. So in the postscript that, uh, that I published in my first uh, uh, issue of, of Geda, it's called An Essay in Protest Anthropology. After doing the serious anthropological research, I had made a statement, a personal statement, to say that anthropology itself is an instrument of colonization. And so unless we rethink it to make it useful for our purposes, the way it is now, it is actually damaging to, uh, to Africa. So this caused a lot of uh, uh, fracas in, in the academic community those who supported me, as well as uh, those who, who, who opposed my, uh, uh, my thinking as being um, basically too, too political and, uh, and not appropriate for, for an academic to, 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 to engage in. So anyway, uh, it was published. Uh, I submitted it to the University of Chicago for publication. The editor told me, if you cut out the postscript, we'll publish it. And I said, I will not cut, cut it out. And so Levine, who was then dean of faculty at the uh, you know, University of Chicago, got into fight, uh, a fight with the publisher, telling him, you are missing an opportunity to, to publish what may be the most important piece written by an African this decade. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I said, I took Levine's letter and my manuscript and sent it to, uh, to uh, uh, Macmillan. Macmillan said, if this book causes this kind of uh, fracas, uh, probably it's probably a good book, so they went ahead and published it. <laughs> so, so it's published by a commercial, by a commercial publisher. Yeah. We, uh, we we will talk about the book okay. and 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 uh, your contributions and okay. into <coughs> that the knowledge about the Gada system. Yeah. But that wasn't your choice. 
No, and that was not my was choice. Not your choice. That was not what you went to. Because for. because of my affiliation with my great grandfather, who is the man who wrote the Hagendaba, the customary laws of Kakarishim. He wrote it. And he was the keeper of the book, Tahazdabtar. He and his son and his grandson still kept it to this day. They are the ones who keep it, they are the ones who Debtar Khaftu, Gensulu and they mediate between pe people using the, the laws of the uh, of, 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 of Karnashim. So because of that, it is customary laws that I wanted to, to study in Eritrea. And so the first proposal I submitted to Harvard was to study customary laws of Eritrea, which is at least four, four centuries old. Uh, and and the, oh, probably the only written customary laws in Africa uh, in written form. Uh, and uh, so it was passed by, by Harvard, funded. I went to Ethiopia, and that was 1961. 1961, Akalor work was uh, director of education. He said, no way. Under no circumstances will we send an Eritrean to Eritrea at this stage because of the problems that have now arisen in Eritrea, which mean, meaning the ELF. Uh, the ELF had already start, started the activities, and so I was prohibited from doing work in Eritrea. I could do any place else I chose, and so I went back to, uh, to, to America to rewrite my dissertation. While I was in America, the librarian approached me and said, do you know that we have published a book on Ethiopia? No. Uh, would you like a free copy since we published it? I said, she took out a copy of folk, the folk literature of the Galla by Enrico Cerulli. Enrico Cerulli is a great Italian scholar who has who spent his time studying uh, uh, mostly Ethiopia uh, and uh, the Horn of Africa. So, so I ended up learning uh, about him, about his work, and he became the focus for my, for my research. Many years later, I met, met him at uh, uh, Manchester, the Inter Ethiopian Studies uh, Conference, and he and during my presentation, I went directly from Borana to Manchester for this conference, and he was sitting on the edge of his seat throughout my presentation because he had tried to figure out the Gada system and did the half job of it and was very eager to, to hear how I had uh, solved, solved the problem. So, so that's a concatenation of events that, that led to my doing the uh, Gada study. Now you get to your study, and yeah. uh, you've decided to study the Gada system. Right, right, yeah. um, not many of us know the details of it, yeah. but from what uh, we've been reading, it's it's um, an indigenous system of governance. Yes. We're, you know, today we hear a lot about governance, right. how countries are governed, and what it takes. Right. So we want to know why, how the Gada system of the Oromo people mm -hmm. relates to indigenous governances in other yeah. parts of Africa, mm -hmm. in the Horn of Africa, and why it's important that this system be uh, a monument of sorts yeah. to the kind of uh, systems that we as, uh, can establish as Africans and make <coughs> them indigenous for yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, how do we work this system without, we hear a lot about democratization, you know, if you have ABC, elections, free press, this, then you're a democratized city. Mm -hmm. But is that not more than that? Is yeah. governance not more than that? And this Gada system, uh, which I want you to tell us about, yeah. uh, covers a lot more than just elections and uh, yeah. the but simplicity of government. Well, it's a whole way of life. It's a philosophy of life. It's an organization built on the human life course. From childhood until old age, you have a place in Gada. You progress from one eight-year period to the next methodically, and each stage you have certain responsibilities associated with that stage. You become herd, a herder at one, at one stage. Then you have your first initiation around adolescence. First initiation, very terribly important. Quite uh, a long, uh, it lasts for four years. The, the initiation itself lasts for four years. So they're inducted into, into office, elect their leaders. They elect their leaders who are going to come to power 21 years later in advance. While they are in that position, they are heads of their own luba, their own uh, generation set. They, so they learn to govern, and, but they're being vetted, they're being checked out during that period to see if they are worthy of the office. 
so if, if you qual qualify after 21 years, do you manage to become a Bagada and head of the, of the institution for a period of, 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 of eight years. There is also a body, an assembly of assemblies, an assembly of five different Gada classes representing the entire society, which meets once every eight years to make laws, to, uh, to do jurisdiction of conflicts, uh, mediation of, of, of conflicts, punishment of criminals, and very serious punishments, which is done by cursing an individual. And whoever is cursed one way or another, they end up dying. Even if they don't kill them, somebody else kills them. Uh, so it's a very efficient method of, of government, very effective. But at this stage, I'm writing the conclusion to the second edition of Gada. Uh, after 44 years, I'm rewriting the book completely, and this is the book. Uh, and in this book, uh, it, I'm concluding it with a chapter titled Gada and the Future of Or Oromo Democracy. And in that, I've laid out the possibilities, food for thought, possibilities of using this as a basis for a modern republic. And I've gone into it in quite some depth. And if you look at their institutions carefully, they have a system of checks and balances very much like the American one. I don't call it that because the Americans are very possessive about, about those terms. So I call it mutual regulation of institutions. Uh, their, their institutions are counterbalanced. The whole society is divided into two halves. They are counterbalanced. Between the sacred and the profane, there's a counterbalancing of forces. Between generations, the generation of father, son and grandfather are counterbalanced. Grandfather and grandson are allied against the father. So that if the father begins to punish in ways that are not legitimate, the grandfather intervenes. But this is institutionalized with them. The three of them actually live, <laughs> live together. So checks and balances is there in a big way, more complex than the American one. But the price you pay for checks and balances is gridlock. Just what we have been going through for eight years under Obama, and still going on now. Gridlock is the ugly side of checks and balances. They have found a solution for that, because they have a branch of government that is solely devoted to peacemaking. That is to say, if there is gridlock between the ruling class and the legislative class, uh, then there's a third body called Gumi, the multitude, the assembly of the multitude. Which, which is a spiritual, not political body, an ethical, not political body, but it mediates all conflicts within government. So if there is gridlock of the type that America is suffering from now, they go to the third body and they get, they get, they, they get mediated, and me, from mediation they go, they, they go to binding arbitration, and then decide, decide the, 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 the problem. So here's a, a branch of, of parliament that does not exist in the Western world, which is going to be part of the parliament of, uh, of, of the Oromo, and it has been a part of it in, in, in history as well. So it's going to be a rewriting of uh, the first book and a rewriting of the institution so as to come up with a model that can be applied into the, the, the modern world. And, and the example I give of uh, democracy gone awry is uh, of these immature democracies that we find in the, less, in the rest of the, of, the, of the, in the third world, basically, uh, where people fight in parliament with chairs. They throw chairs at each other, you know. I mean, it becomes very violent. Uh, and they have methods of pacifying passions. They do that by blessing. The Abagada will tell his audience, if they, they, they really begin to go at each other uh, in ways that are angry and not listening to each other, he says, rise, they tell, the, he to, to tell them to, to rise to their feet, face east, which is the place of their origin, and then he blesses them from behind them. And he blesses them, the blessing may last 15 minutes. The whole purpose of it is to pacify frayed nerves so that they can go back to rational discourse after that. And at the Oromo Studies Association of, uh, uh, at, in Toronto that was held, 
Muhammad Hassan, Dr. Muhammad Hassan, who is a Oromo historian, uh, who was chairing the meeting. And there was an elderly gentleman sitting up front with a, a beard that was treated in henna, red beard, a, clearly a traditional gentleman. And he didn't understand a word that was being said in, in, in the meeting. It was because it was all done in English. And he was very angry. And so this started a, a, a really angry exchanges between all the members of the, of the association. So Muhammad Hassan said to the elder, please rise and bless us. And he did. He blessed the, the assembly. And that way he pacified the group and it went, they went back to rational dialogue. So they have actually methods of consensus building, methods of pacification, that is an important part of any system that is built on checks and balances and therefore vulnerable to gridlock. So this is what uh, Oromo have to offer to, to, the, rest of, uh, to the rest of Africa. Yeah. Well, anybody that's interested in the GADA system will have to get your books right. <laughs> and the up-to-date version too. But let's get back to you and uh, how you progressed after. Um, here you are, a young man, now written uh, a book that's mm -hmm. going to be for generations worth, mm -hmm. and you're in the United States. What would compel you to go back to Africa? What would compel you to go back to Eritrea? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, the, when the Dirk took over, uh, I was in Addis, uh, beginning a survey of Addis Ababa, a social survey of Addis Ababa, half done. We did one year. But after we finished the, the one year, uh, I went to the Dirk, who had just been, just been assembled, and I told them, uh, I have, we are researchers, we have done this research for one year, we have another year to, to, to complete the, the work. Uh, so I wrote to them to say, Kur uh, allow us to continue the, the research. It's useful to, 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 to Ethiopia. And they wrote a letter, two, two, two line letter to me, Kur professor, here so meader gutanat, would they too, have you touched in a mid corner if you fuck a dal car on? I forget. Uh, and I wrote a two-line letter to them, Kur Gwadoch. Tanatu, Wutetu, Beckett Mia Mitawakona, Lemonis de Ragal. Kasalam Tagar. And so I returned the funds back, $75,000, back to the Ford Foundation and started working on other, other topics. So by then, I had begun uh, to retrace my steps and to think about doing work in, 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 in Eritrea. But not yet, because I'm still quite deeply involved in, in, in Oromo research. And then that, that went on until 1984, where I was doing my last uh, round of research among the Oromo of Kenya, focusing this time on the two great famines, 1973-74, 1984-85 both famines, to try and understand how people survive great famines by doing in-depth ecological research among the pastoralists, among two groups of pastoralists, camel pastoralists and cattle pastoralists, Gabra and Borana. That, that study was finished in 1991, ready for publication. I dropped it and started doing other things in Eritrea. It's still unpublished, and someday I hope, hope, to, hope, 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 hope to publish it. So, uh, uh, in a way, what happens 1984, when I finished my research in Kenya, is I meet an agent of uh, the EPLF in Nairobi. His name is Bisrat, and Bisrat took me to his home, and we spent the whole night talking about liberated Eritrea. And it was a complete eye-opener for me. Uh, of course, I fo I'd followed the Eritrean, uh, the Eritrean struggle in newspapers. I had a book of newspaper cuttings uh, for, for that entire period, but no direct connection with, uh, with, with the EPLF and no, no knowledge of how I might be able to, to reconnect. So, so, so uh, Bisrat tells me, why don't you stop over on the, your way back to the United States, stop over in Meda. And I said, is that possible? <laughs> I said, leave it to us. <laughs> so I go to Khartoum. They whisked me off to Port Sudan, and the next day I was, I was deep in the heart of uh, Meda. 
And it was an incredible, totally amazing experience. Uh, I spent a month waiting, waiting, waiting to start working in, in, in Eritrea. In the meantime, I was being vetted, checked out to see if, in fact, I'm for real. Since I've been away from Eritrea, I'm concerned with Eritrea all these years. Why, why all of a sudden this, this, this newfound... <laughs> So in the end, I was invited for lunch by Isaias, and uh, and uh, and uh, gave, he gave me his his car and his the driver, and told told me you can go anywhere, uh, t t take uh, any pictures that you want, learn as much as you can about uh, about about the field, and then you maybe you can come back and help us at a later at a later stage. So I did that. I toured all over Eritrea. They told me don't wear anything shiny. Uh, you know, ashig mekinaka park park is so so it does not visible that kind of stuff. So, but this was baptism by fire. You know, I mean, it was was total immersion in a way of life that I really knew absolutely nothing about. But when I when I saw it firsthand, it was an incredible, incredibly moving experience. Fifty thousand men, giving up everything and devoting all their lives to doing nothing but the liberation of Eritrea, single-minded, you know. And I mean, to me, this was a life changer. So basically, I went back to Swarthmore College, where I was teaching, and I said, retool. I changed my entire curriculum of teaching. Uh, and literally, I began a series of seminars and, 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 and courses that are going to be focused on things that might be useful to, to, to Eritrea. So by the time I went back to Eritrea in 1988, I went fully armed with books, with materials, with a, a, a computer, the first box Macintosh computer, the very first one, <laughs> loaded with GIS software uh, so that they could actually start writing all their textbooks, their Fitzalmetat, their Metsahit, and, and everything else in, in a language. Uh, in, in, in the prepared on, 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 on the Macintosh, and I showed them how to use the Macintosh to preserve data. I wrote an article, I presented an article at that stage, which has disappeared. It has disappeared in the doc documentation centers, so I'm going to still find it. But it's titled Information Management in Eritrea. It is a way of using digitization as a method of preserving this vast amount of information that EPLF had gathered. Uh, so that, that was uh, a major attempt that I made in 1988. Ten days after liberation, I was in Eritrea. Ten days after. There was no means of transportation in or out of Eritrea. We arrived in Khartoum. Uh, and uh, they gave us a vehicle to go into, into Eritrea. And we went in. Eritrea was still burning at that stage because the remains of the of the uh, Ethiopian army were all over all over the place bodies and I photographed all of them I mean every one of them that I could see that might be of historic importance I photographed mainly for the purpose of proving that the Eritrean army did not go uh, pursue them while they were fleeing from Ethiopia and kill them which is what was being said in New York at that stage. And I, I proved to audiences in New York that they died of thirst. Most, virtually every one of them is lying, on, leaning on the, on the tree with food, tin cans spread out on the ground. So they eat this salty food and they have nothing to drink. So they die of thirst, basically. And there was one picture which Tagadelti told me, go back and find that picture. It was a case of a, fi a, a, a soldier who, with his, with his colleagues, uh, ended up eating all their food and had to move on. One of them ha didn't have strength to, to move on. So what he did was he took his gun and took a cow from, uh, from the from the peasants, from the herders, shot it through the head. It fell, and then he tried to use his uh, dagger to to bleed the car in order to 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 drink the the, the blood, and he collapses next to 
the cow. So soldier, cow, gun, <laughs> tin cans. That was a picture that has to be captured, so I did. I captured it, and it's going to be part of my picture book for, for from, uh, from Eritrea, which is it's going to be a big, big book uh, of just pictures, all Kodakron slides, which I will show to Tagadelti, and I'll get their reactions to the picture, and I'll publish their commentary on one page and the picture on the other page. Nothing but... No comment on my own, just their own comments. That's going to be one book that is in the works. The other book is going to be a summation of all the work that I did in Eritrea during the last uh, 25 years.